Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It's Monday, bright and early, at least on the West Coast, on July the 17th, 2023. Some six years ago, I had a friend on the show, Hilary Mason, um, who is a longtime serial uh, digital entrepreneur and technologist on the show when it was a TechCrunch show. Uh, and she talked to me about how AI, artificial intelligence, is now the heart of our innovation economy. Um, six years later, of course, uh, it's even more central. I'm not sure if you can get more central than a heart. And Hillary is back on. Uh, six years, Hillary. Um, looking back, do you think you were a little um, early on that one? Is that a bit premature six years ago to believe that AI is now at the heart of our innovation economy? Back then, no one entirely knew what AI was or is. Now, perhaps people have a better idea, although there's some controversy. If I can play on your metaphor here, I would say that uh, in 2017, uh, AI had just become perhaps the heart. Today, we might argue it's also becoming the brain. Um, and I also, I think I disagree with you. I think people didn't know what AI was in 2017. And I think we know even less today about what it actually is, where it's useful. But what I was excited about back then was that we had these step function improvements and capabilities where we could build systems that could automate or support um, our interaction with knowledge. And that has only accelerated. And now here we are in 2023 and it becomes possible to do even more with the technology. Hillary, when historians of AI look back at the 2020s, is the key event going to be ChatGPT and Sam Altman's OpenAI? Is that the, the key change? It's been, uh, the media is obsessed with it, uh, for better or worse. Is 2023 um, the transformative year when it comes to AI and business and, um, and how it's changing the world? 2023 is certainly, I'd say yes, though we are also a little bit overextended in hype. And a lot of the excitement is around aspects of the tech that are not yet fully developed. And so it's a bit of a nuanced answer. Chat GPT was itself a user experience change on technology that had actually been out in the market for a couple of years. Right. So we can talk about this at a bunch of different layers. I'm a technologist, so I like to think about it in terms of like, what is the fundamental capability of the model we're looking at? How might we then do something new and exciting with it? That's my happy place. But we can also look about look at it at the level of what are the interfaces and how do people start to think about the technology? And certainly chat GPT as an interface change created this tremendous excitement around using this set of tech, which is now called generative AI, but has actually, of course, been around and useful for a very long time and has a bunch of different components that we can use in different ways, in new and exciting ways. And then I'm gonna argue that we've even gone a little bit too far um, in terms of where we think uh, we might be able to use the tech in sort of um, in different workflows and different creative processes. Hillary, give me some equivalents in the history of tech. You talk about uh, chat GPT as an interface change. Is it an equivalent, for example, to Netscape and the creation of the browser? Andreessen and his team at Netscape didn't invent anything. They simply put pieces which already existed together. Is that an equivalent? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a wonderful example um, where the internet had a bunch of protocols and, you know, they're even were a few browsers already. Uh, there was links, right? Text browser. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't nearly as beautiful. And then all of a sudden that change in experience 
opened up a whole set of new things you wanted to build or people's imaginations sort of opened up because of that change in, in how they were able to use and imagine the tech. Why did it take so long? You weren't the only person in 2017 to be arguing that AI was shaping or reshaping our innovation economy. Why did it take so long for, for Altman and OpenAI and ChatGPT to come along? So I think I'm going to start answering this one on the technical level, and then let's get into the people side of it, right? So so I had started a company, not my current company, but another one called Fast Forward Labs in 2014. The idea there was that uh, research and innovation in machine learning and AI was stuck. I didn't think uh, academic research was working on the most interesting problems. Um, and at the same time, corporate research was leaving a lot of opportunity on the table because they didn't have the, the sort of familiarity with what was coming. And so we started this, this, or I started this research lab that also built products with our customers. In 2014, our very first research report was on natural language generation. In 2015, 2016, we started working on deep learning for summarization. Um, and we built a whole bunch of products around that stuff. Uh, a lot of other people were doing similar work in the space, and there were some fundamentally new and useful things like embeddings, which allow us to take text and represent it as a computable object, meaning that we can take a document and represent it as essentially a bunch of a big vector, and then we can compare it to other documents and actually have some conclusion about the content of those documents semantically. Um, these are sort of the building blocks. Um, there were some fundamental improvements in what we can do with that stuff. And then with models like GPT-3, um, we started to get the generative side of text as well. And so, so there is techno technologically a fundamental step forward in what's possible. Um, and the same thing on the image generation side, or, um, or even now, uh, there are a lot of folks working on creating 3D models out of text prompts or um, 2D image prompts, right? So like lots of exciting expansion and what's actually possible. That's on the, the sort of tech math side of the world, but that alone doesn't do anything because a bunch of nerds playing around with stuff, and, and I say that as one, um, without actually building useful products, um, like isn't all that interesting. So then what happened was things like the, the sort of chat GPT user interface change. Um, I am personally still extremely excited about what this tech means for changes in search metaphors. I don't think anyone's nailed that one yet. I would love to see that product exist. Um, I don't well, think that's a great um, user experience. Yeah, I mean, Google has Bard, and of course, Google wants to have one foot in the past and one in the future yeah, with they're AI. Doing it wrong. And so <laughs> they're, they're doing it wrong? They're doing it wrong. Well, we'll get um, to that later. That's interesting. So, uh, sorry, go on. I interrupted you. Well, so then here we are now, right, with um, with all of this excitement. And I think what's happened is that people have woken up to the fact that these models do offer a fundamentally new and interesting capability. Um, but what we haven't figured out is what you can actually do with it productively, how it actually impacts business models, how it can impact economics. And we see a lot of people sort of saying, OK, I'm going to replace human labor with this. I think that's also a poor framing of where the tech actually creates value. Um, but part of it is that we just haven't figured it out, right? So like chat GPT, um, like chat is the dominant interface and it's a terrible one, right? And we're in this moment where we have to invent what products really can be on top of the capability. And it's really exciting and messy and nobody really knows what they're doing. So that's where I think we're at right now. So it, it's both, I'm extremely excited and optimistic about it. And then also, you know, sort of deeply pragmatic. Hillary, what I want, I'll tell you, and maybe you can deliver this for me. I want a, a smart bot that I can have on the show that will interview me. Because I actually think I'm more interesting than you. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm alone in that sense. Uh, most people think they're more interesting. And I can get lots mm -hmm. of other people. I can't get people to interview me. When am I going to be able to have that kind of bot? I mean, this sounds like a human problem, not a technical problem. Why is it a um, human problem? I want a smart machine that can converse with me about the world. 
I mean, one might say that you're able to have that kind of experience today, not just with something like chat GPT, but with something like Replica, which is a digital companion or character.ai, right? Where you could even create a bot version of yourself to interview you. And then at least you have an interviewer of an The Replica caliber. already, maybe I'll have to go and look right. at that. What is Replica? Um, it's an app that creates a digital companion where, you know, for folks who enjoy chit chatting with a, you know, bot, they can have that social experience. So um, you mentioned, um, I'll, I'll go and have a look at Replica. Um, okay. You mentioned that you thought Bard was doing it wrong. Um, Bard, of course, being the AI uh, play of, of Google. What do you make more broadly of the the politics of what's happening now within the tech industry of, of Altman throwing in his chips, it seems, with Microsoft, the Microsoft OpenAI Alliance, Bard, uh, uh, Google launching Bard, uh, Musk now launching his own XAI. What's your sense of the landscape broadly? There's a lot to talk about there. Um... And you've left out in your description here any of the folks who are building an open source where I mm. think a lot of the interesting work is happening. Um, and I think there is a shift towards open source models being the ones where people are actually going to be able to build interesting production systems on those for a whole bunch of reasons. Well, let's get to the, because uh, the open source is really interesting and important. I know it's, 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 it's where you're both your brain and your heart lies. But what, why is Bard doing it wrong? What are they doing that's wrong? And, and is OpenAI also doing it wrong? Well, it depends on what the goals are. Like when I think about search, you know, if you think about just raw, you know, sort of Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo search interfaces, what you do is you put in a query in a box and then it gives you back a ranked list of links on the web that may contain the information that you're looking for. And that is a metaphor of search that was relevant in the year 2000. It is not the metaphor of search that we need today. So today we need, I have a human mind that is un, unfortunately limited in that I can only read a certain number of words in a given rate less, of time. Le right? Less limited, Hillary, than most people though. Well, thank you. But, um, but even so, when I think about the body of knowledge that exists out in the world, what I want is a system that's, that helps me understand that landscape of information, shows me that there are clusters of opinion and research here and there, and then lets me say, okay, give me a summary of this one. And by the way, perhaps it knows everything I've read on the topic already, so it can personalize that. So if it's something that's new to me, it can be you know, fairly substantial with a lot of references. And if it's something I'm already an expert on, it can be like, here's the two sentence summary, all you need to sort of incorporate that into your mental model. And then I want to be say, be able to say like, cool, now help me understand this little landscape of information. So I think that the, the opportunity in search is in realizing that the problem is to get the information that is out there in the universe in a format that a person can ingest and understand it as quickly and efficiently as possible and as accurately as possible. Whereas instead the attempts from what we're seeing from all the big search vendors right now are sort of like, here's a chat bot you can talk to. And by the way, sometimes it'll lie to you. I'm like, that's not a good experience in any dimension. What about, um, so, so you're saying that, uh, OpenAI, Microsoft are making the same errors as Bard, that Bard isn't unique here? Yeah, I don't think Bard is unique. I think that uh, folks who are aiming at the search problem, and OpenAI is not. So like for them, my view, and this is back to your earlier question on the whole landscape, like is that chat GPT is a loss leader marketing tool and it has been tremendously like successful in igniting people's excitement around particularly GPT-4 um, from OpenAI, which is sort of the default starting point for anyone who wants to play with the tech. It is perfect for that, um, but it is not a search engine. Right? Altman, so uh, Altman recently said that he was going to develop a, a personal assistant. Some people interpreted that as a potential problem with Microsoft. Microsoft, of course, Core business still is 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 its desktop, I guess, platforms. Yeah. Um, they also want to promote Bing in their competition with the Google search engine. Are all these companies 
too backward looking? I think there are certainly ways in which they are. Like, I mean, it's impossible to not consider that, say, Google's business model is largely around selling links, right? So anything that changes the metaphor of the link is complicated. Um, and I would imagine quite controversial. Um, and that means there's an opportunity space for younger startups, of which there are at least, there are several sort of perplexity jumping into that space, you.com jumping into that space, right? Like people who don't have that baggage, who do have the tech capability sort of coming into it. Um, and that's something I'm excited about. Maybe they'll figure it out. Is, um, so you're very familiar with the arguments about surveillance capitalism. You and I have talked about it a lot uh, in the past. Could could these new companies get, quote unquote, search beyond surveillance capitalism so that users are not trading their data for free information, free links with AI, with these new ways of doing technology? That's a really interesting question. I think it is possible to build a search system that is not. Um, and in fact, you know, that's sort of DuckDuckGo's whole, you know, pitch and it's true. I don't know that AI really makes that easier or harder. I do think there's a lot of obfuscation in uh, what various companies will do with say, if you're prompting a system and they're using their prompts to retrain their models, it's very possible you could leak information. Um, and I believe there've been a couple of instances of that happening. Um, that's more of an issue with corporate trade secrets than I think anyone's personal um, personal data, at least so far. It's an interesting question. I have to say, I don't really know the answer. Uh, I, I do want to get to to Hidden Door um, as an example of an AI company, which is your company. But mm -hmm. go back. Let's go back a little bit to, to open source. I often hear that term, and I have to admit, sometimes I'm a little suspicious because when you look behind open source. You still have corporate wealth and power. What do you mean by uh -huh. open source? And how can that change the potential for AI and corporate power uh, and all the problems that have been associated with big tech over the last 30 years? I mean, I, I mean all of it in the sense that there are, like we could probably have a three hour debate on different open source licenses and which ones are appropriate for AI model weights. And then where the underlying training data comes from and what rights are required in order to create a truly open set of weights. Um, these are conversations that are active in the community. And I certainly have a point of view and so do others. Um, I don't think they're settled. But when I say open source, I mean that it's very easy to talk about OpenAI and Google and Microsoft um, and even Facebook, though Facebook has made their Llama model open for non-commercial use, but then it's inspired this whole set of people who are creating fully open and, and commercially useful versions uh, with that as the benchmark, right? So it's Open source is as much around any single artifact as it is around the communities that form and come together because it plants a flag. Um, and then it also is about a management of the balance of power in tech. And so all of these larger companies have collected extremely large data sets that gave them an advantage for the last couple of years in terms of the kinds of models they could train. And they also invested a huge amount of money in things like human in the loop reinforcement learning. So actually paying people to say this answer is better than this one. Um, that's uh, the kind of investment that a lot of smaller companies can't make themselves. It's millions of dollars for a given model. What open source gives us is the ability for an individual to say, cool, I'm gonna start with this pre-trained model. I'm gonna fine tune it or build something around it for my particular application. And then off I go and I can build something new. And so as somebody thinking about the whole ecosystem, it is not just the big tech companies who wanna lock you into an API subscription, which by the way, is a, if you're a founder of a company, it's a terrible idea to depend on any one company for a core capability of your business. Like you have to own that. Right. Um, whereas the open source community provides a balance to that. Um, and also, even though there's, those models may generally be less successful on certain benchmarks, 
for the specific application someone is building into, one of them might be quite a bit better and they can actually own it and run it on their own terms. They're not subject to OpenAI's licenses or let's say their servers don't work, which happens all the time. Um, so the, it, there's a lot of complexity there and thinking about what kind of, um, like as someone who is a big fan of, of, you know, a person getting an idea and wanting to give them the resources to be able to go out and try that idea and to not be locked into working with any one large tech company and like essentially putting all the money there. Um, I think open source is incredibly important. And it's also important to recognize that a lot of these models are being trained by communities that are global. This is not just a, a sort of like California doesn't own this. You talked about data sets uh, today, um, some authors, thousands of authors, including Margaret Atwood, who's been on the show, urged AI companies, I'm not sure what exactly an AI company is, I think all technology companies now are AI companies, to stop using work without permission. Where? And I, I know this is a, might sound like a rather dumb question, Hillary, but I can ask you, um, where are they getting their their intelligence. So when authors, for example, complain or, or filmmakers or poets or journalists complain that their intelligence is being, quote unquote, stolen or used without permission, do they have a point? Do, do these AI platforms, whether they're open source, as the ones you talked about, or the, the, the open AI, uh, Google uh, platforms, do they have a right to use this this data, this intelligence? This is an active question at the moment. And what we are seeing is a collision of, you know, we have 20 years of training machine learning models on data off the internet with nobody really caring um, as one precedent versus a bunch of people suddenly being told, hey, these AI models are going to replace you. By the way, we don't have to pay you anymore. And we're doing it off of your, the, your creations without your permission, no attribution and no rights. Like they absolutely have a point. Um, I think they have the point. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not something that is settled. Like there are active lawsuits on all sides. Um, I do think it's it's possible to make a value statement that one should not train a model without permission or rights to the underlying data. But that's that's all it is at this point. It is not a precedent. There is no rule. There is no law. Um, or at least th those things are being debated actively. And I say that as a computer scientist and not a lawyer. It's a huge issue. It's one that uh, perhaps we could have a whole show about. When you were back on the show on in August of uh, 2017, we talked about women and technology, women and AI. You reminded me, although I don't think I really need reminding that this is a male-dominated business. Last week when uh, Elon Musk announced his XAI initiative, all the people that he put together on his advisory board, they're all men. Um, is AI still mostly dominated by men is this something that troubles you as a, as a distinguished female ai entrepreneur and technologist there is a very large percentage of the best work in the world in ai being done by people who are not dudes um they don't tend to get recognized for it at the same level um and there certainly still are huge issues with all sorts of you know, unhealthy and, and unwelcome racism, sexism, like practices. Um, so yeah, it troubles me a lot. And I do my best to build a, you know, a team and a company where everyone can thrive, no matter what their background is. Um, and I also find that in AI and machine learning, um, some people, you know, sort of go to school for this, but a lot of the people working in the space have come to it from another background. Um, and I mean that, you know, the math is the same, right? So like you could have a PhD in physics, you could study applied math, you could study neuroscience or economics or, you know, uh, anything where you're getting a great grounding in statistics and linear algebra is excellent uh, prep for, for working in this space. 
And it's one thing I love about it um, is that people come to it with this real diversity of experience and diversity of backgrounds and diversity of, you know, sort of different cultures and different sort of identities too. It is really important that the tech be built by people who can consider all of the things that are important to the people being impacted by the tech. And that means that better tech is built by people with a variety of diverse backgrounds. So I care about this deeply and have done my best to build teams and create environments where that can happen. That Elon Musk doesn't care doesn't surprise me one bit. Let's then talk about your new initiative, uh, your new startup. I'm not sure how new it is, Hidden Door. When did you found it? And you're the co-founder and CEO. And what is it? It's not new. We started this three years ago. Um, and this is what we do at Hidden Door is take any work of fiction and make it a playable social role playing game that you can play with your friends. And that means that if you read a book you love, you see a movie you love, uh, we actually license and work with the creator to then allow you to say, OK, I just finished this novel. I'm still thinking about it. Um, I want to go play a story in this world where you make your own character. And then you and your friends together with a lot of the dynamics of a tabletop role playing game, sort of like Dungeons and Dragons, like that kind of collaborative improv energy um, can go into that world and do anything you want to do. Um, tell any story you want to tell within the rules of the world that the author has set. Um, and we came to this because, you know, over three years ago, we're looking at this technology before it was exciting to anyone else and sort of saying, what kinds of experiences become really possible now? Um, and it, it is like, I used to play a ton of tabletop RPGs. Um, I'm still a big fan, right? And there's a particular kind of creative social energy there, but it takes a lot of work. You need to have like four hours to sit around a table with your friends. One of your friends needs to run the game and plan the story for you, sort of like being the, the head, head storyteller. Um, what this allows us to do at Hidden Door is build a system to play that role. And so, you know, we work with authors and creators to bring their worlds onto our platform. And then our players get to have these role playing adventures in those worlds um, and they're social adventures. So you get to have your character, have a fun time with your friends. You can do it. It runs on the web, so you can do it for mobile. Uh, you can pick it up and put it down. It's uh, it's really delightful. Um, so, but coming back to the issue um, that I brought up earlier on authors and being unhappy yeah. that AI companies are using their work, I assume, let's say you wanted to make a game around um, Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, um, that you would need her permission or the permission of her publisher before you do that? Absolutely. So I, I'm also a huge personal fan of Margaret Atwood's work. So I would love to do that. So if she's listening, um, what we would do is work with, her or her representative, we would sign an agreement for that. And then the opportunity here, it, we don't compete with authors. What we do is give authors a way to bring their fans another way to experience the, the work that they've already done. Um, and so we work with them until they're happy with the adaptation. They're confident in the rules. They can be very specific about, you know, like, this kind of plot can never happen. This kind of plot should happen a lot. This character can only be hinted at, never seen. This one can never die. There should be lots of death, no death. Um, what we've built essentially is a trope machine. And then authors are able to come in and say, we'll, we'll take whatever writing they'll give us. We'll map it into our machine statistically. And then they get to give us a set of rules for their world and play with it until they're happy. So yes, we work with authors directly. And our goal is to give them an additional way to engage their fan communities um, on top of engaging with the original work. So it's not, um, we're not trying to replace the author. We're trying to bring this kind of social role-playing experience to worlds that maybe would not have gotten a gaming adaptation or a role-playing adaptation in the past. So you're in a sense, uh, one headline uh, about CNET describing you as you're reimagining the way we play role-playing games, but essentially what you're doing is democratizing it, allowing anyone, even if they have a self-published book. So presumably in the past, Hollywood studios have been able to do what you're doing. Now you're allowing everyone to do it. 
That's right. And if you look at the number of books that have gotten, say, a AAA gaming adaptation, it is very small and very expensive. Those games take years to develop. Ours takes an afternoon. And how much demand is there, Hilary, for that? I mean, do most authors, for example, want to turn their books into role-playing games? Do they even understand what that means? <laughs> I mean, it's some yes, um, absolutely. I think uh, I should say first on the fan side, there is a ton of demand for it. We have a mailing list that's uh, piling up of more people than we can handle wanting to play. Um, and on the author side, I think we're in this moment where authors are sort of being faced with the AI monster. And most of that certainly in the media and what we're seeing in Hollywood right now is being framed as let us use AI to replace you or take your means of making a living, you know, sort of arguing that these AI systems are as creative as these authors, which they absolutely are not. What we're trying to do instead is say, let us allow you to use this tech to offer your fans an additional experience and then frankly, like make more money. Um, which is important, I think. And so, yes, there's a, there's a pretty big appetite among the creative community to turn this around and to be the ones driving the use of tech. So, as I said, you're the, the co-founder and you're the CEO of Hidden Door. How many clients do you have? How much success have you had so far in the three I years since you founded the company? So we've spent three years building a controllable and safe uh, story generation engine, which is also something a little bit different. Um, this is not just an LLM. This is something where we give our authors a lot of control over what happens in those worlds. And then we have several authors we're working with um, to be announced later this year. Several meaning three, five, a hundred? more on the the single digits at this moment we're just starting these conversations now can we you have, also uh, help uh, authors sometimes struggle with the creation of narrative as they're writing their books their screenplays mm -hmm. can you help with that that's not what we do though there are other folks in the market who are building tools for authors when it comes to role-playing games do you see ai as being a trigger for more people playing role-playing games? I mean, is it a generational thing? I have to admit, I've never played a role-playing game, although some people might say that's the story of my life. Um, what exactly is a role-playing game? And, 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 and do you see this as being more and more popular in, the, in an AI future? Yes. Uh, so a role-playing game, roughly, is uh, a couple of people telling a story together. And there are usually rules that provide a structure and a scaffold for that story. And they might be, you make a character, meaning that there are some trade-offs. You've made a decision about, maybe you want to be a super strong fighter character. Maybe you want to be a very charismatic social character. The way these systems are designed, usually you have to pick one. And you and your friends pick different things. So you create a party, you create a group of characters who then are able to tell a story together. And the rules, the thing I love about role-playing games is that the rules are not there. This isn't a game you really win or lose. The rules are there to provide a scaffold for you to have fun um, and to have moments that you remember where it's like, oh, remember that time I tried to swing off that chandelier, but instead it co collapsed to the ground and we ended up falling into the pit and discovering like it's those, it's a structure for that, that kind of shared imaginative experience. And yes, there is, there are more people who want to play role-playing games than people who are able to, because it takes a lot of, in, like you, right now you have to buy rule books, you have to have the time set aside to play. Um, and it's hard to do that. And so, yeah, I do think that what this does the role the tech plays is that it just makes it possible for more people to have this kind of experience together. Well, it's exciting, Hillary. Um, I think, as always, with your stuff, it's going to be very successful. I wish you the best with Hidden Thank Door. You. Uh, finally, um, as I said, you were last on the show back in 2017 in August, so six years ago. I, AI is now the heart of our innovation economy. We've seen each other a lot since. We haven't been on the show. I hope you'll come on again before 
2029, which is uh, summer of 2029, <laughs> which is six years time. But in all seriousness, where are we going to be with AI in 2029? What, what, what do you imagine? Is it going to have, so far it's all talk, all hype, all hysteria, business, cultural and otherwise, both negative and positive. By 2029, is AI going to be reshaping, revolutionizing, profoundly disrupting the world, do you think? By 2029, so I'll just say outright, I am not one of those people who thinks AI is going to become intelligent, like an AGI person. Yeah. I think that's a religion and that there are a lot of people who spend their energy there and sort of on the that's doom the, the, the Kurtz Wiley and uh, what does he call it? The convergence. Yeah, that's, that's not where, where I'm thinking about this. Rather than that, I think a lot about what are the capabilities that these systems are really good at? And they're really good at producing more of things we've already done a lot of. They are really great at helping us with, with sort of like the tasks of intellectual drudgery. I do think that in some cases we will see some pretty dramatic economic disruption. Um, it's really a question of how we want to allocate the value of those productivity gains in a fair and equal way. Um, and that's true whether we're talking about writers and creative work or whether we're talking about, um, I don't know, like uh, the work that perhaps somebody who's doing more operational work is doing, uh, moving information from middle management, point A to point B, summarizing information. So I do think there will be tremendous gains in those, those capabilities, but um, not the kind of thing that will be, you know, destroying society. Um, and I do think that the, we're in a moment where there's more hype than there is reality. We've got to wait a bit for the reality to catch up. The 2029 is far enough away that some pretty dramatic things will certainly happen by then. One thing I will say that is very specific is that, and we're seeing this in gaming a lot, what the AI capabilities do is shift the moment of production from ahead of time into the moment of consumption, meaning that like, if you're making a video game, the level might not exist until you go to play it, right? I think this opens up all kinds of personalization, all kinds of new experiences that we're just starting to explore. And so I do think that six years from now, we will have games that are creative and look nothing like the games we have, as well as, as ones that largely resemble what we have today. And we'll see that as well in things like, um, you know, the way we write, maybe those tools for authors, maybe in the way we plan our PowerPoint decks, right? There's a lot of space for, um, for this.